The internet to date has been built largely in a rather trusting way. Um, in its origins in the late 60s and 70s and then 80s, it was mainly uh, an academic research facility. It wasn't until the 90s that it really took off outside academia. Recent internet-inspired development at ARPA is the Enterprise Room. That's Enterprise as in Starship Enterprise. There have been a lot of efforts since then to develop more um, secure communications protocols to improve the reliability and security of operating systems and other kinds of software, but I think we still have a long way to go to build a trustworthy, resilient internet um, that fully reflects that dependence that's now being placed on it by society. the debates around how we're going to deal with the challenges in the next 10 years, feeding the world's population, dealing with unpredictable climate, dealing with mass movement of peoples around the world, all of these challenges, when you hear the ideas that people are having to solve them and to match them, they're all dependent on cyberspace. And so it's quite clear it's not going anywhere, we're not switching it off. So to my mind, it's another environment. It's like the natural world. We have to worry about it, and we have to make sure it's there for generations to follow us. We have a lot of evidence from the last almost 50 years now in how data protection and privacy laws have developed that that kind of approach, well, we're just gonna try and sweep up everything and then have rules behind the scenes about when uh, government agencies or when companies can access that data, that that kind of approach doesn't work very effectively. Of course, intelligence agencies are monitoring what's going on on the internet. That's, that's not news. The Snowden leaks have given us a much better understanding of the scale of what's going on. So the fact that some of the figures are quite startling. For example, that the US National Security Agency is collecting five billion location updates every day from global mobile phone networks that are applying then sophisticated data analysis tools to all of that data. So to work out, for example, patterns of association between people, which people are spending time with each other, which people are traveling together, uh, even in some cases, it turns out, the NSA and CIA were able to warn their own agents if they could see that an, an agent's pattern of movements with their mobile phone was being mirrored by someone else. In other words, they were then under them, themselves under observation. People all over the world are realizing that these programs don't make us more safe. They hurt our economy. They hurt our country. They limit our ability to speak and think and live and be creative. Some of the things that the intelligence agencies have been doing uh, were a surprise, uh, particularly in terms of weakening encryption standards, which um, are really important for protecting people's personal data right across the internet economy and in government agencies, including in sensitive areas like in e-health, for example. So I think that, that has been a surprise because it does seem rather um, an unstrategic thinking. That's something the companies were very unhappy about because they think it will damage trust of their customers around the world in these American businesses. So I think that's one very interesting area to come out of this. How far will this change the, the structure of the global internet economy? That finally leaves you with national or regional isolation, if you like, or the balkanization of the internet you often hear about. Um, where, uh, to a greater or lesser extent, businesses have to build national services that comply with national laws. Uh, we've seen a debate in the Brazilian parliament about a law that would, that would introduce these requirements, that would say if an American company wants to offer services to Brazilians, they would have to build servers in Brazil and physically store the data of Brazilians in Brazil. Um, Internet companies are very concerned about that kind of legislation because it would significantly increase their costs. They would have to build national servers in countries around the world, potentially nearly 200 UN countries, for example. But 
I think if we're going to avoid that balkanization, we need to see some movement at the international agreement level, particularly by the United States. Certainly, um, since I started researching this area in the 90s, uh, the internet is much more mainstream that you'll get front page news about issues related to the internet these days, whereas 15 years ago it would have been relegated to the technology pages at the back of the newspaper. Um, I think that's a very positive thing. It means the broader population is aware of the importance of some of these issues, uh, but also politically it's important because it means policymakers themselves are aware of the issues, but also they know that their voters care about them. So they know that it might ultimately um, be a reason that their constituents might vote for or against them, how they reacted to things like uh, the Snowden revelations. If you look to date, there has been, uh, I think, not nearly enough recognition by states uh, about how important this issue is in the long term and even if it will be expensive to build much more secure systems that I think that's something that we need to be planning for in the longer term. Um, I hope that it doesn't take a disaster to uh, cause governments to change those positions. That is unfortunately of course often what it does. I hope we don't have to see that kind of thing uh, in terms of cybersecurity.